they're all down here as well. So we'll go into that example later on as kind of a special example. But what I want you to see is right away we have a wonderful way of picking out inconsistencies. We can take any of these um, records that have geographic coordinates for one region, but the text says a different region. Okay, so this is an immediate way to clean up, or at least to signal the problems in our Ghanaian records. We can go in a little bit farther, and now you can see more of the inconsistencies. This region, just a few. And we can pick those out, and we can go back to the herbarium sheet, see what the problem is. Sometimes you'll say, oop, somebody just wrote down the wrong, the wrong region. And other times you'll say, hmm, you know, it says these coordinates, it says this district, can't do anything with it. Okay? So, that's kind of taking you through the, the basic thinking and um, a couple case studies. I want to just give you a little bit more kind of of the downstream part. So, we do this error detection, we do some data cleaning, and we want to think all the way down the line to really improving the data set. And John's going to give you more of that in the course of the day. Um, but I just wanted to give you a few comments. One comment is the difference between detecting and flagging the errors. Okay, we already talked in our Taraco data set about these problems. But there's a difference between that and fixing the error. Okay? Now sometimes you go back to the original record. In this case, it's a tag on a bird in a museum. You look at it and you say, wow, the data capture person must have been at the end of the day and asleep. And that record has nothing to do with Chicago. It has to do with somewhere in East Africa. Okay? That happens. And so in that case, when you go back to the primary source, or think about this past week, you go back to the image of the primary source, so maybe you don't have to go visit the collection. You look at that label and you say, oh, that's what it is. And then in other cases, maybe we have to do some investigation. You remember what we said about this one? Well, that's a very clear case where we can say the data record says South Africa. There's a common error, which is that people forget that the convention is Southern Hemisphere latitudes are negative. And so we can very easily correct that latitude and bring it down here where it belongs. We document it. We say what we did. But that's pretty good. Because what does it do? It increases the consistency of our data set. Right now it's inconsistent, and by bringing it down here, for a very obvious reason, we increase the consistency of our data set. I'll give you a little bit longer example, back to the plants of Ghana. Remember I told you that we were going to look at the Volta region. So let's do that. There is a, a zoom in on the localities uh, from Volta, and you can see right away that they are densest in Volta, but they're not confined to Volta. And there's something really interesting about this little problem. Can anybody think of what it might be? You've seen this problem in the previous slide. Where's the prime meridian? Run something like that. And if you think about it, if we make mistakes about the sign of our longitude, what happens to these points? If they are listed as negative longitude right now, 
If that's erroneous, and we make them positive, where do they end up? This point ends up here. This point ends up here. So watch, I'm gonna take those points, those are the inconsistent points, the volta points that don't fall in volta, that are in the Western Hemisphere. And all I'm gonna do is change the sign of their longitude and watch what happens. Okay, we still have some problems. But these are those formerly inconsistent localities and they all now become consistent with our external data source. And notice, you know, they, they're even out in this, in this eastern extent and up here. So that's not definitely the solution. And I would certainly want to take all of these and go back and look at the data label. But going from that to that, based on a common known error in data management and biodiversity, that's pretty interesting. Okay? So, we know that biodiversity data are abundant, but we also know that they can have lots of problems. This is kind of putting the whole consistency idea into a summary. A huge source of problems is outdated taxonomy or incorrect taxonomy. Um, I have a project on the distribution of the birds of the world. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm working through about 85 million records of birds from the whole world. Two years ago I went through and I fixed 11,000 incorrect names. It took me two full months dawn to dusk, and I wanted to update that just over the last two years, and I thought, okay, another 2,000, 3,000 localities, and literally, sorry, not localities, names, literally, it's, it was another 11,000 localities. So I've now worked that number down to 5,000, but I still have 5,000 names left to fix, okay? So taxonomy is a continual source of problems. Uh, Georeferencing is a big, complex challenge, as you will appreciate from your lessons on Saturday. Um, and that also consistently will pump a lot of problems and challenges into your data. And my point in this talk is very simple. It's that what you need to do is explore your data. You need to play. It's one of the most fun things about science for me. Somebody gives me a data set, even if it's on like traffic accidents. I play with it, okay? Alex gave me the, the University of Ghana Herbarium data and I had the convenient excuse of this talk, but really I just wanted to play with those data. It's fun, it's challenging, makes you think. But that's also the central challenge in the, in the process of, of data cleaning. And so it has to be. Data cleaning, these explorations, have to be part of everything you do when you analyze data. So now just a few comments about downstream. What happens next? Let's imagine that you've done a really good, thorough job with cleaning up the taxonomy cleaning up the geography, cleaning up the consistency of fields within the data set. What comes next? So there, there are a couple of things just to point out to you. One is um, that we have lots of opportunities to give information about the quality of data in a given field. So, John went over one perfect example of this with you the other day. You give a latitude longitude and that refers to an exact point on the surface of the earth. And you all know perfectly well that we never ever get an exact point. There's always some radius of uncertainty. And that's something that we not just want to, we have to capture that information in order to describe that latitude-longitude coordinate. 
Maybe it has an uncertainty distance of a centimeter, or maybe it has an uncertainty distance of a thousand kilometers. And we ought to treat those data points very differently. For taxonomy, the biodiversity world is actually pretty good at getting at our um, uncertainty about taxonomy, which is to say, at least in a non-digital format, we do it pretty well. Here, somebody had, had identified this as subspecies Ben Diary. If you remember Loxia curvirostra, those of you who did the, the data cleaning exercise, or the data capture exercise with me. But then Alan Phillips, remember that's the guy with the high error rates. He said no. He said the back looks like uh, minor um, and then he gives all sorts of commentary. Or in the botanical world, here's our original identification, and then here's a redetermination. And you heard in the insect world that sometimes they'll have five or six tags with different people's opinion. Okay, same deal here. So, uh, we're pretty good about talking about our, our uncertainty in taxonomy. We don't always express it quantitatively very well, but at least we've got, we've got that tradition. But if you look at Darwin Core, you actually have lots and lots of opportunities to express uncertainty, precision, or sources of problems. You have all of these uh, fields and more where you can say, well, this is a record based on a specimen or based on an acoustic recording and each of those has different details. And you saw all the things about georeferencing where we can tell not just the uncertainty but also what was our protocol, what were our sources. Maybe we look at the source behind one of those problem records and we say, oh yeah, that map's wrong. You know, that map had a problem with this. So all of these fields and more are opportunities for you to express problems in the data. And that enriches the data set massively. Now, what we really would like to do is to say, this data set is clean and that data set is dirty. Or maybe this data set gets a quality rating of 10, and that one gets a quality rating of 3. Right? Um, and so you'll see things like this. You know, a wonderful headline. GBIF to target data quality and fitness for use in 2014. Wow. Cool. Right? But after this talk, I hope you're thinking, well, what does fit for use mean? Is that just fixing the taxonomy and adding the georeference? Or is that having it ready for niche modeling? Dots on maps? Or does that like deal with you know, individual movements or banding history or whatever? Which is to say, we may use a given biodiversity datum for lots of different things. And fitness for use is relative to the use. So you really, really need to watch out when you see a statement like that. You can certainly improve data quality and you can certainly improve fitness for use. But at the end of the day, you can't say, okay, my data set gets a 10. It's an iterative process. It takes a long time. Essentially, every time an expert walks into your museum or whatever it is, you can make your data better by, by saying to that expert, you know, I remember you published a, a revision of this genus two years ago. Could you go through all of our sheets and make sure we have the names correct? Right? So, more useful than an overall, you know, 10 versus 3, quality assessment, um, more useful is to develop diagnostics. But it's going to be multidimensional. I'll show you one example of that. And that's this project Species Link, 
which is uh, run by a, a small research institute in southern Brazil. And let's see, it links 6.2 million online records from 317 data sources, mainly across Brazil, plus New York Botanical Garden and several others in the, in the US. Um, so what do we see in Species Link? A lot of attention to these things that I'm talking about with giving people metrics of quality. So right away when you pull up, you know, here's a, an herbarium from the Federal University of the State of Minas Gerais. Um, you can see where that is. It's kind of right, right about there. And right away you can see kind of the history of their collection. They went from zero records and over time came up to 100,000, 110,000. Okay, we'll come back to the map. They give you, you know, of, of the total size of the collection, 163,000 records. Online are 109,000. Of those, 21,000 are georeferenced. Last update, online since, and the software, Brahms. Okay, so right away we get some characteristics of the data set. And then we can go to this page. And this page is your diagnostics. Okay, let's zoom in on the map first. And what I want you to see is this. What's that? Zero longitude and a real latitude. Notice that we get that vertical line through zero, uh, through zero, zero, but that its latitude corresponds roughly to the limits of latitude in Brazil. Because most all the records in this, in this herbarium come from Brazil. Now, notice also that we have some records from Madagascar. Am I right? Are you sure? Notice that Madagascar kind of runs a little northeast-southwest, but these records are running northwest-southeast. What, what are those records from Madagascar? Somebody forgot to fix the longitude. It's got to be negative in Brazil and not positive, right? What are these records out in the middle of the Atlantic? You guys are really quiet. We'll have to have no more breaks in the middle of, of these courses. What are those? Are they really collecting plants out in the middle of the Atlantic? The equator runs kind of like this. So maybe those are southern hemisphere records that have a positive latitude. And then, guess where they'll end up? And in fact, all of this is probably the east-west problem. So right away you see some things that are going to come out as problems in this data set, and they're problems that are pretty easily fixed. But what I really want you to see is the whole set of ways that you can get at potential problems. First of all, we can start with really simple things. Like of the 109,000 records, 87,000 don't have coordinates. That's a data leak. You can go in, georeference those records, and improve your data immediately. Now, there's 1,669 records that are in the ocean. Maybe some of them are marine alga, right? That could be. But it's pretty easy to check whether a given plant is marine or terrestrial. If any of those is terrestrial, you signal that as a problem. Um, there are 26 records that have no catalog number. And then they also give the maximum catalog number. Remember there were 163,000 specimens in the collection and 110,000 um, captured. But we have catalog numbers that go as high as 1.5 million. So maybe those are errors in the catalog number. There are some duplicate records. And let's see. Now, then we can go down into the taxonomic, or, taxonomic arena. 1,415 families that somehow didn't make sense. 
Maybe it's not on the authority list of families that, that the Brazilians were using. 609 genera that don't make sense, 716 uh, species that don't make sense, 726 authors, uh, 7,230 duplicate records, and other inconsistencies, 26. Go and check those. Um, here's an interesting one. If the identification year is before the collection year, right? That's a problem, either in the identification year or in the collection year, but it's a problem with one or the other. And then in the locality, um, if there is no name of the country and state, that's suspect. If it's an outlier for, um, for the, the data set, like this point down here in Antarctica, that's a probable problem. Uh, longitude, latitude outside the limits of the world, that's quite probably a problem. Um, if longitude and latitude are equal, if longitude or latitude is zero, now there are some zero latitudes in Brazil, but there shouldn't be many, right? I'm standing exactly on the equator and I'm collecting a plant that's growing exactly on the equator. It won't be very frequent. Um, longitude, latitude in the sea. Uh, the municipality name doesn't fit with the coordinates. Uh, the coordinate units appear to have problems or other cons inconsistencies. Um, species link provides recommended latitude, longitude, so that's not so much of a problem. And in some cases it can provide country and state names. But my point is, this is just one example of how multidimensional this problem is. If you're a good curator of your data set, you're going to say, okay, today I'm going to work on family names. And I'm going to figure out an appropriate name for the family of those 1,415 records. And maybe the next day you'll go in and look at these 11 records that have equal longitude and latitude and sort those out. By the way, there's nowhere in Brazil where longitude and latitude are equal. Okay? So, conclusions, it's all stuff I've said before. Data quality matters. Data sets always have error. The question is whether that error is within your tolerances for the use you want to put the data set to. You can flag the erroneous data you can fix it sometimes. You have to document the quality of the data. And you also need to remember that fitness for use is relative to the use. So that's, that's kind of an introduction to a day spent playing with uh, data quality, data cleaning, error flagging. Um, so John's going to take you into a set of, of uh, explorations. Um, by the end of the day, you can clean up your own data set. And in fact, I had forgotten about this, but we have the data sets that you guys captured. So uh, at least for the zoology group, I can, the macrozoology group, I can circulate that data set. And I'm sure the other two data sets can be, can be circulated if they exist. Um, so my point is, today is your day to think about what comes next. This is kind of Alex's situation. He did a monumental, very admirable effort to get that herbarium largely captured. He has a data set. It's a neat data set. He can put it to a multitude of uses. He knows there's error in there. And now what do you do? Okay, so that's your challenge for learning today.